2nd Timothy chapter 2 as we continue in our series in 2nd Timothy and uh, we're going to begin in verse 14 we're going to try to get verses 14 15 and 16 but I'm not I I can't make any promises of that because there's a whole lot in these three verses but I I at least want to read them to begin with And we'll say what we can on these verses this morning. 2 Timothy 2.14 Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study. Have y'all ever seen this verse, verse 15? (laughs) We emphasize it and for good reason. It's the key to understanding the Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, notice three words in each of these three verses that start with the letter S, and that'll be our outline. First of all, verse 14, strive not. Secondly, verse 15, study. Verse 16, shun. Strive not, study, shun. Not too many professing Christians following these things today, but we certainly need to if we're going to be Pleasing the Lord in the work of the ministry. So first of all, strive not. Now, he said, of these things put them in remembrance. Well, the immediate context has to do with the faithful saying in verses 11 through 13. Um, To put in remembrance is to bring it to mind. And you do that by emphasis. It's not that we forget truth necessarily. It's just that we don't always think on it as much as we should. And so when you come to church, you ought to be thinking on the Word of God because the Word of God is to be preached and taught, bringing into remembrance things that if you've been saved for any time, you ought to know. Uh, But it's good to put it in mind, to put it in remembrance. And so verses 11 through 13, it is a faithful saying. And we've shown you that There are three faithful sayings in Paul's epistles to Timothy that correspond to three major doctrines revealed through Paul for this present age of grace. Salvation in Christ, the body of Christ, and the coming of Christ. And these are things that ought to be emphasized in the church. Faithful saying means it's worthy of all acceptation, as it says in 1 Timothy 1.15. It means in Titus 3, you affirm it constantly. And by the way, the passage in Titus 3 has all three in there. The faithful saying in Titus 3 has to do with all three things. And so, uh, you affirm it constantly and you're bringing it to remembrance. This must be emphasized. And what is the faithful saying in verse 11 13? Let's remind ourselves. For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. We're crucified with Christ. Yet we live with Him. We walk now in newness of life, and there's coming a day our body will be raised, fashioned like unto His glorious body. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. The sufferings of Christ, the fellowships of, the fellowship of His sufferings, there is afflictions of the gospel, as we saw back in chapter 1. He's not t- Look, we're all going to suffer in this life. But He's not just talking about suffering in general. He's talking about suffering... For Christ's sake, for the work of the ministry. Well, we're going to suffer, but we're also going to reign. We're going to reign with Him. As members of His body, we are going to inherit the kingdom of God, and our part of the inheritance is in the heavenly places. We're going to reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about service. He's talking about reigning with Him. And it's got to do with the judgment seat of Christ. When we stand in the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our service, if we denied Him in order to avoid suffering, we didn't want any reproach, we didn't want to be persecuted, and of course nobody wants to be, but if we compromise to please man, to get out of suffering, then the Lord will deny us and 
how we reign with him. In other words, we'll suffer loss in terms of reward. All right? And he said, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Eternal security. A man can go to the judgment seat of Christ and watch all his work go up in smoke, and yet he's saved, according to 1 Corinthians 3. Eternal security. If you're not rewarded, you're still saved and in glory. The issue is reward. All right, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Our unfaithfulness doesn't change his faithfulness. He, won't, he will not deny himself. We're members of his body. We, even if our faith gets overthrown, as we're going to see in verse 18, the foundation of God stands sure. The Lord knoweth them that are His. We're sealed with the Spirit till that day of redemption. That day of redemption is when we get the redemption of our body uh, in glorification. And so the Apostle Paul very plainly and clearly teaches the eternal security of the body of Christ. So that's something I emphasize the coming of the Lord. I emphasize the judgment seat of Christ because that's what's going to happen upon the coming of the Lord. There is the joy of seeing Him and being with Him and being like Him, but there's also that aspect of giving an account to Him. And you better prepare for that. It needs to be emphasized. Paul emphasized it. He talked about the judgment seat of Christ quite a bit. He used the exact phrase twice, Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5, but he deals with it in many passages. You, I personally think about it every day. Every day. I, I think, Lord, you could come. And then when I think about the coming of the Lord and what a joy and blessing it is, I also think about the reality that I must give an account of how I served Him. And that motivates me. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, when Paul talked about his motives for the ministry, it's the judgment seat of Christ that's right in the heart of that chapter. So put them in remembrance. A good minister of Jesus Christ is not one who is always trying to come up with some new thing to keep the interest of his carnal hearers. I'm afraid that us Americans are a lot like the Athenians. In Acts 17, it said the Athenians spent their time in nothing else but either to hear or tell some new thing. That's why people are obsessed with the news, for an example. Always got to know the latest, got to know the latest, got to know the, latest. the news, some new thing, right? But it's the same old news every day for the most part. But, um, you know, but in the, in the church, you see a problem with this where men wanting to get a following, wanting to distinguish themselves, are ambitious to come up with something nobody else has ever seen so people can say, oh, what a brilliant man. There's a lot of danger in that. What we ought to be doing is putting the brethren in remembrance of the sound doctrine that they should already know. <laughs> Look at verse 2, back in verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Committing it to them, teaching it to them, getting them grounded in it to the place they can pass it on. Of these things put them in remembrance. What? The things that... Paul delivered to us in this age of grace. How about verse 8? Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That needs to be emphasized. Go back please to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I took note of this years ago. The only place where Paul refers to a good minister of Jesus Christ, he tells you exactly what he does. And so that's what I'm interested in. I've had over the years all kind of people who I'm sure mean well try to tell me what a pastor ought to be. I really couldn't possibly care less what people think a pastor ought to be. What I care about is what God told me to do. Amen and amen. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Back at the end of chapter 3, he was talking about the mystery of godliness, which is the fact we're made godly by being members of the body of Christ, our union with Him, our spiritual union with Him. Many are going to depart from that, and they're going to go toward the mystery of iniquity, which is religion, man thinking he's making himself godly by the energy of his flesh. 
Notice what he said. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, what does that look like? How about verse 3? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. See how they're trying to discipline their flesh, thinking that's going to make them godly? But didn't even God Himself command His people to abstain from certain meats under the law? That was the Word of God under the law, but we're not under the law, we're under grace. And so if the devil can't get you to reject the Word, he'll just mess you up with it, getting things out of context. And if you fail to rightly divide the Word of truth and you put yourself under the law, you're an apostate today. Because we're not under the law, we're under grace. He said, Forbidding to marry, command abstain from each, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, and them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, nothing be refused, if he receive with thanksgiving. For it's sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. All right? Put them in remembrance that there is a danger of apostasy. There are people who depart from the faith. It could happen to you. You better be mindful of that. And put them in remembrance that we're not under the law. We're under grace. God has declared under grace that we can receive any meat with thanksgiving. Knowing where you're at in God's plan for the ages, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, nourished up. See, spiritual health comes from proper nourishment, but that's not all. Notice verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. It's not only to get nourished up in the right thing, it's refusing the wrong thing. But not only that, notice, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Being nourished up in the words of faith ought to produce godliness in your life. There shouldn't be the disconnect that there seems to be with many people between what they believe and how they live. <laughs> there ought to be a great connection between the two. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. You see that? It's in the context of put them in remembrance. Emphasize this. Emphasize the need for godliness. All right? Hey, we, we rejoice in our position in Christ. But that's not all there is. There, that needs to be lived out. There is the practical exhortation that flows out of the sound doctrine. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Doesn't that destroy Calvinism, by the way, in verse 10? It absolutely does. Christ died for all. And... Um, all, he will have all men to be saved, but He's only the Savior of them that believe. They have to receive it by faith. And so you look at this and you see where people get out of balance. If you're not balanced, you're going to be unhealthy. Some people, all they want to do is sit around and get nourished up, nourished up, nourished up, and they do nothing with it. Other people, all they want to do is reject everything. Everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. Everything's wrong. You know, they can find something wrong with everything. Other people, all they want to do is go out and do things. But they don't, know, they don't study the Word of God. Hey, study the Word of God, reject the wrong things, and then do something about what you're learning. You've got to have all three together, right? That's a good minister of Jesus Christ. And if you notice, that's what we try to do on a, on a consistent basis. I try to teach sound doctrine. I try to correct false doctrine. And I try to exhort us to live out what we say we believe. That's balance in the ministry. But you've got people today in some circles... That understand we're under grace, but they think that means you, you being under grace, there's no responsibility, there's no service, there's no works. They think that's legal. They think everything's legalism. You say, we ought to tell others about Christ. That's bondage. You're making me feel guilty. What? How, how do you not want to serve the Lord? How do you not want to tell others about Christ? How do you not want to do that? What are, that's not bondage. We don't have to do anything to be saved. We're saved by grace. But being saved by grace, we're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, <laughs> which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so this issue of putting them in remembrance. And by the way, putting them in remembrance also includes how to live. 
Isn't that what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul said in verse 16, you know, the church at Corinth was all messed up and they had bad doctrine which led to immorality and carnality and ungodliness and all of that. And 1 Corinthians 4.16, um, Paul said this, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere and in every church. Not just his doctrine, but his ways about how he went about his doctrine. And you know, you got these verses on following Paul in terms of the doctrine Christ revealed through him to give to us. But that issue of following Paul is also very practical, which is exactly why he said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 9, if you remember, he said, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Isn't that the first two letters in doctrine? How about that? That was kind of cool, wasn't it? I just made that up. No, I'm just kidding. I've heard that before. Yeah, do. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You know, you know what that... That's in Titus 2. You know what he does in the whole chapter? He tells people how to live. He said, aged women. I know there's none of those, but just in case. This is what you ought to do. Aged men, this is what you ought to do. Young men, this is what you ought to do. Young women, this is what you ought to do. Servants, this is what you ought to do. And on it goes. And it's because, you know, we, he said, those things which you have both learned and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Wait a minute. Wait, what do you mean he's going to be with me? I'm a member of his body. Yeah? But do you act like that? See, I'm in Him and He's in me. That's my standing. But I want that to be manifested in my practical state. You understand what I'm saying? If you're saved, you have peace with God. That's your standing. That doesn't mean you enjoy the peace of God. That's your state. How about it? See that? You see the balance there? Much of preaching and teaching is designed to put you in remembrance of what you should already know. If you come to church always expecting to hear some new thing, you're going to be disappointed because this book's pretty old. <laughs> and if you've been saved a while, now there's a lot in here. None of us have learned it all. Don't misunderstand me. There's going to be things that are new to us as we grow. But it's not always going to be some sensational thing. You know what? You ought to enjoy thinking about the basic things of the Word of God. The love of God. The cross of Christ. These basic things that we, we, we should never get too far from. We should emphasize, and I told you before, a reflection of the way people are is the fact that I can preach a message on Jesus Christ and then I can do one on the Antichrist. Which one do you think will get more views? Why are people more interested in the Antichrist than they are Jesus Christ? Um, you know what? Paul said to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Philippians 3.1. To say the same things. It's safe. It's good for you. Even Peter, you know, has the same idea. You don't have to turn there. 2 Peter 1.12. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you in always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. <laughs> Peter's talking to his readers about things they already know. He said, you still need to hear it again. And he said in 2 Peter 3, 1, he said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words. To put them in remembrance is to make people mindful, to stir up their minds to it. All right, so Paul suffered much because of the message he preached. And we've, and we've talked about that, all, uh, about that already in our study of 2 Timothy. There was truth that Paul was willing to suffer greatly for and die for, but then there were things he said, strive not. Don't waste your time striving about these things. Instead of striving about it, he said you just need to shun it, as we're going to see in verse 16. In other words, when it comes to words to no profit, when it comes to bad doctrine, don't sit around all the time arguing about it. If you recognize bad doctrine, reject it and move on. 
Twice in this epistle, he exhorts Timothy not to strive. He said it in verse 14. He said it down in verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive. And yet, and yet in the same epistle, he testifies that he had fought a good fight. And he says we're to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Alright, so here's the thing. We are to not strive about words to no profit, but rather we're to stand strong in the word of truth. You see the contrast in verse 14 and 15 between words to no profit and the word of truth? And so, by the way, we are to strive in the work of the ministry. Remember back in verse 5, if a man strive for masteries, yet he's not crowned except he strive lawfully. Doing the work of the ministry is revealed through Paul, the wise master builder who laid the foundation in this age of grace, preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and gave us the blueprints to do the work of the ministry. Philippians 1, he talks about we strive together for the faith of the gospel. There is a striving, but there are some things not to strive about. And that's got to do with words to no profit. And by the way, notice in verse 14, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord. I mean, I think it's nine times in First and Second Timothy, Paul gives charges. You know what that is? It's a mandate. It's an order. That's military language. And he's doing it before the Lord. That's responsibility. Okay? We, we're to take these things seriously. All right? Now, the words to no profit concern false teaching that will subvert the faith of the hearers. You know what it means to subvert? It means to overthrow. As in verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. To subvert the hearers is to overthrow their faith. He said, don't waste time with words to no profit that do nothing but subvert the hearers. The words to no profit are contrary to the form of sound words. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. The truth that Christ from heaven revealed through Paul for this age of grace. This form of sound words found in Romans through Philemon, 13 epistles given by inspiration of God to the body of Christ. We're to hold fast to the form of sound words. Those are words that are profitable. Not only Paul's epistles, but by, the Bible said in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? Profitable. Alright? So there is great profit. There's nothing more profitable than the words of God. So the words to no profit is false teaching is what that is, the bottom line. Paul said in um, 1 Timothy 4, he said in verse 15, Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Save from deception, save from apostasy. If you give yourself to the word of God, your profiting will appear. So when we're talking about words to no profit, we're talking about false doctrine. We must not waste time arguing with people promoting false doctrine because all we're going to wind up doing is giving them a platform to present their teachings. We don't debate heretics. Okay? Um, what do we do with heretics? We shun it. Okay? Uh, that's why the only time... Listen, you check me out on this. Debate shows up in Romans 129 in all the list in that list of all these sins of the heathen. <laughs> and it shows up in 2 Corinthians 12.20 in another list of sins in the church. Debating is of the flesh. What we do, you know what we do? We do Titus 1. Look at that. Titus, this is what we do. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Hold fast the faithful, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. The gainsayers are those opposing the truth. We don't argue with them. We just tell them like it is. We just say, here's the truth. Take it or leave it. But I'm not going to sit here and go on and on and on with a heretic. You're just beating your head against the wall. 
He said, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Let's not give them a platform. That's why Paul said in Romans 16, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to give a lot of references here, but Paul talks about this stuff quite a bit. In Romans 16, he says to mark and avoid some people. In Philippians 3, by the way, he tells you to mark and follow some people. <laughs> mark and follow the right example, mark and avoid the wrong. In Romans 16, he said, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. He said, you need, by the way, verse 19, your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I'm glad, therefore, in your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Don't spend all your time looking into heresy. Get wise concerning that which is good. The more grounded you are in sound doctrine, the easier it will be to recognize false doctrine. And when you see it, avoid it, reject it, shun it. Okay? And so... He's very clear that we are to avoid them, which is to shun them, which is to strive not with them. Um, again, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, listen to this. If any man teach otherwise, other than what Paul taught on this matter in the context, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ was speaking to Paul, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. What are we to do? Sit around and argue with them on, on, on Facebook? Or on YouTube, start calling it boob tube. Because I, I'm just saying, folks, there's, you, we need to get in the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with listening to a teacher that's going to help you, but you better get in the Word. Of, and there are people that will believe anything their favorite teacher says. He can get up and, and, and get into a heresy, and people just say, well, all right, let's go on with it. There's no excuse for that. What you're supposed to do, notice what he said, from such withdraw thyself. You separate from false teachers. You separate from false doctrine. No, people don't take this stuff seriously, and that's why they get subverted. We need to take it seriously. Titus chapter 3. Again, Titus chapter... I'm telling you, Paul had a lot to say about it. Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Here, here's how it works. Titus chapter 3. Verse 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. Especially these legalists, and of course if you understand the legalists and how they would be about the genealogies and these different types of things they dealt with. He said, for they are unprofitable and vain. And a man that's an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Everybody, look, nobody is right about everything. We're, we're a work in progress. We're all learning and growing. Being mistaken is one thing. Being a heretic is another. <laughs> That's when you, you start teaching a false teaching and then you use it to draw away disciples after yourself and you start dividing the body of Christ. That's heretics. And Paul said, what do you do? Well, you admonish them once, twice, but three strikes and you're out. He said, a man that's an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. And so you don't, just go, you don't sit there and strive about it all day, every day for weeks on end. You try to tell them. You tell them once. Okay. In patience, you tell them again. But then you're like, you know what? I'm done with you. If you want to talk about the truth, come see me. Until then, I have nothing more to say. I've had all kind of, but you have to understand, I've had all kind of people over the years try to get me in debates. I had someone just recently, would you debate? So I ain't wasting my time with that. Because when you get in that kind of stuff, the people who are into that, they already know what they believe, and they're just going to pick sides, and they're not really going to listen. You're not going to really get anywhere. So what I do instead is just teach the truth, teach the truth, and that will uh, exhort and convince the gainsayers. That's how it works. The words to no profit, by the way, 
As you see in verse 9, Titus 3, 9, it's, got the, it's in the context of the law. In Acts 15, there's a passage where some came from Jerusalem to say that the Gentile converts couldn't be saved unless they were circumcised after the manner of Moses. And that was wrong. And the twelve said, we didn't send them out to tell the Gentiles that. And it says in the passage, they subverted people. Okay, so we're talking about the legalists in the true sense of the word. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verse number 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That be the doctrines of grace, what God is doing in this age. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. The problem's not the law, it's, the, it's how people abuse it. Notice what he said. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient and so on. The lawful use of the law in the age of grace is to show people they're sinners in need of salvation. But once you're saved, you're righteous in Christ, you're not under the law. The law is not made for a righteous man. So legalists is people who are telling people that they can't be justified and or sanctified without their flesh doing the works of the law. If you walk in the Spirit, you have the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul said, against such there is no law. You don't need to be under the law. You live on a higher plane. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's just that God brought us under something better when He brought us under grace. And He didn't bring us under grace to say now righteousness doesn't matter. The law said you need to be righteous. It couldn't make you righteous. Grace makes you righteous. It'll give you the uh, imputed righteousness of Christ the moment you believe, but it needs to be imparted through your walk as you walk by faith in who you are in Christ. And so the words to know prophet are legalists taking words of Scripture out of context and bringing... Look, God Himself said, don't eat certain meats, right? Today, if a man gets up and tells you that for religious purposes, saying you're not right with God unless you follow the dietary law, he's teaching a doctrine of devils. The devil can take the words... Of, look, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, right? But it becomes unprofitable when you rest them. Peter warned about those who would rest the Scriptures to their destruction. The profitable words of Scripture become unprofitable when you fail to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Which leads us right into verse 15. The reason why there are so many legalists who are trying to bring people under the law is they don't rightly divide the Word of Truth and understand the difference between law and grace. Look at verse 15. Study. Alright? Strive not... Okay? Don't waste your time striving about words to no profit. What you ought to do instead is study the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, the best way to discern what is false doctrine is by being rooted and grounded in sound doctrine. Spend your time studying the word of truth. Now, I've preached on this verse so many times, and we use it quite a bit, so I'm not going to say a lot. I'll probably say more maybe next time. But you understand in a verse-by-verse -verse series, this is not the time to stop and, and do a whole series on right division. I mean, we've done that and we will do that. But, that I'm, but in the context here, it's very simple. We have the word of truth, but in order to understand it, we've got to rightly divide it. Now, that's the key verse on Bible study. So if it's the key verse on Bible study, you can expect the devil going to attack it, right? And that's why all the new versions mess it up, every single one of them. They all change study to say something else, and they, and they change rightly dividing. And they, and they mess up the very key to Bible study. The NIV, for an example, says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. But rightly dividing means rightly dividing. Yeah, we need to correctly handle the word of truth, but rightly dividing is rightly dividing. <laughs> what are we to do? Well, first of all, there's the mandate. What to do? Study. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. It's a work. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs that the righteous studieth to answer. 
<clears throat> in Ecclesiastes 12.12, 12, much studies, awareness of the flesh. Studying is much more intense than reading. It's diligent searching of the Scriptures with a desire to understand it. You really examine it. You're careful about it. And you're like the Bereans in Acts 17 who search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They received it with all readiness of mind. Um, it, it is a matter of the Spirit giving you understanding as in 1 Corinthians 2. And so you study as a workman. Uh, you look up the word workman, <clears throat> the first use of it, I believe, is referring to the tabernacle and those that built the tabernacle. Well, we're in the age of grace built, and we're builders on the temple of God. The temple of God in the age of grace is the body of Christ. How, do we do, how are we going to do the work? We've got to do it according to the word of God, uh, rightly divided. Uh, in Hebrews 5, it refers to those that are not skillful in the word of righteousness. And that, therefore, they can't handle the meat. All they can handle is the, uh, the milk. There is a skill to the Word of God. And as a workman, when you study, you study it God's way since it's God's Word. What are we to do? Study. Why are we to do it? The motive is to show ourselves approved unto God and not to be ashamed. Bible study is about knowing God. It is about knowing God and serving Him according to His will. We, we have a, a, a personal accountability to God Almighty. Study to show thyself personal approved unto God. Not approved unto men. Approved unto God. Which ultimately is going to culminate at the judgment seat of Christ when we must give an account of how we serve the Lord. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be ashamed if we didn't rightly divide the word of truth. Paul talked about the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3. and He said he laid the foundation which is Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, how do you build on that foundation? Every man's work will be tried of what sort it is. What's the quality of our service? We've got to follow the wise master builder. Paul laid the foundation and gave us the blueprints, so to speak, for doing the work of the ministry in the age of grace. And that's why he said there must be heresies among you <laughs> that they which are approved may be made manifest. Who's approved? 2 Timothy 2.15 tells you. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.18, he said, uh, Not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Who does the Lord commend? Study to show thyself approved unto God. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're going to give an account of the judgment seat of Christ for the things done in our body. The doctrine we receive by which we serve the Lord. We must give an account of our service. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the method. What to do? Study. Why to do it? Be approved unto God. How to do it? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now what it means to rightly divide the word of truth is to be understood by the context. Verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. They did not deny there was a resurrection. Their problem was they put it in the wrong place. Rightly dividing the word of truth is an issue of acknowledging and maintaining on a consistent basis the divisions that God put in His word. Okay? getting things right according to what the Word of God reveals. All the Bible is the Word of Truth. Psalm 119, uh, verse 43, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7, for an example. Scripture is the Word of Truth. And so rightly dividing the Word of Truth is not an issue of dividing truth from error. We need to do that also. It's an issue of dividing truth from truth. In other words, what was truth for Israel under the law may not be truth for the body of Christ under grace. And you note those divisions, but you got to be careful, you see, because we have those hypo-dispensationalists, and those are the guys that won't acknowledge the divisions that are there. And they think the body of Christ is in Acts chapter 2 where it's not. They're ignoring a division there between prophecy and mystery. What's happening in Acts 2 is prophecy, not mystery. <laughs> but then you got, on the other hand, you got these hyper-dispensationalists. And they invent divisions that are not there. They, they start teaching the, some divisions and God said, Come here, Gabriel. Did you ever hear this? Did you know that? There <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But, I mean, people come up with some... There, there, there are... Hyper means you're going beyond. You, you're, you're inventing things that are not there. 
All right, so don't ignore the divisions that are there, but don't envision, invent divisions that are not there. Okay? All Bible students divide the Bible. The problem is most don't rightly divide it. Everybody who says there's an Old Testament and a New Testament has made a division. <laughs> but people don't rightly divide it. Now you've got to understand when it comes to the Bible, the whole Bible is for us. It's profitable for us. Uh, we need the whole book. That's why God preserved the whole book. If all we needed was Paul's epistles, that's all we'd have today. But we got 66 books that we need. And so the whole Bible's for us, and God does not change throughout the Bible in who He is. He doesn't change in His person. He doesn't change in His principles. What He changes is His dealings with man as He progressively reveals more truth. Now the Bible is completed, and there's no more revelation to be added. We have a complete book. But the, the thing is, although God doesn't change, He does change in His dealings with man. And so whereas all the Bible's for us, 2 Timothy 3.16, it's not all written to us. It's not all written about us. That's why we got to rightly divide. Now listen, believing the Bible and rightly dividing it go together. In the same epistle, you have a great statement on the inspiration of Scripture. I believe I have the words of God. And if I'm going to understand them, i got to study it God's way. All right? In order to understand the King James Bible as it's written, you've got to rightly divide it or you're going to be confused. And so what do people do? Because they don't understand, they start trying to change the words to make it match up with their limited understanding. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, you can leave everything just like it is. You can leave Mark 16 and the end of the chapter right there because it belongs right there. It's not our commission. But because people aren't having the signs following and doing all the things that said, you've got so-called scholars saying that doesn't even belong in the Bible. They're trying to mess with the Bible to line up with their understanding instead of getting their understanding to line up with the Bible. You've got to believe the Word and rightly divide it. And so, if it's not the Word of truth, then what's the point of spending all the time studying it? Rightly dividing what? The Word of truth. The King James Bible is the preserved words of God in English. It's an amazing dispensational book that was translated by non-dispensationalists. How did they produce a dispensational masterpiece when the Anglican translators didn't rightly divide themselves because they were led of the Spirit of God? Amen and amen. That's called divine providence. That's called Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. God still works in the age of grace. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a King James Bible. It's a miracle of God. And, and I, I heard a guy recently trying to give all the glory to the translators. Not me, buddy. I don't, they were smart, no doubt about it. But this book is well beyond their capability. I give the, I give the Holy Spirit the credit. And so we have a perfect Bible. It's the word of truth. And we need to rightly divide it. And by the way, the people who don't believe the King James Bible, it won't be long and they'll quit rightly dividing it if they are. Because they go together. They go together. So we're going to wind this thing down eventually. Almost done. But you get to stay here and eat. We're having food. So I can just, you know, you don't have to go to a restaurant or go home and make anything. It's all right there in the next room. I'm not going to get to verse 16. But let me finish here on verse 15. Let, let me say, I'm going to finish, but before I do, in verse 16, we'll pick it up there next time, but notice how they go together. So you're not striving about words to no profit. Instead, you're studying the word of truth. And so if you're not striving, when you hear the false teachings that come, and my goodness, do they come. It's everywhere. It's worse than ever. Because Paul said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. And my friend, any one of us can get messed up in our doctrine. Humble, we need to humble ourselves and trust the Lord and, and take these warnings seriously. And so when I'm hearing somebody going against the form of sound words and rightly dividing the word of truth, I'm just going to shun that because it's nothing more than vain and profane babblings that's going to increase unto ungodliness. False doctrine always increases ungodliness. You got a false doctrine being just recently coming up. Uh, some dispensationalist denying there's a judgment seat of Christ. You know what that's going to? You know what that's going to do? Increase ungodliness is what it's going to do. It's false doctrine. Okay, and it don't matter if it's my grandmother teaching it; she'd be wrong. Of course, she's not because she's in heaven. Both of them. <laughs> I don't. I when people teach false doctrine, I don't care who they are; they're wrong. And if I do it, I'm wrong. You understand? It's not about the person. It's about the book. It's about the doctrine. And when you start calling out false teaching, people say, oh, you're being mean. Oh, come on. 
Have you read this Bible? You've got to do it. God is very clear about the need to do that. And so, I told someone recently, they, I'm calling out their false teaching, and I said, it's not about you, it's about the doctrine. I would do this no matter who's teaching it. Okay? And if I get off on false doctrine, I expect spiritual leaders in this church to call me out on it. And hopefully if that happens, I'll be humble enough to receive the rebuke. But because of pride, people wind up digging themselves deeper in the hole they're in. And one thing about false doctrine, you watch it. It's a snowball. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Okay? We've got to take that, folks, consider thyself lest thou also be tempted. I can, it's not a matter of if you can get off on the wrong track. We all can. It's a matter of what are you going to do when you do it. Are you going to get right or are you going to be stubborn and continue down the wrong path? And so, shun these things. All right, verse 15, as we wind up in conclusion, let me end with this. Rightly dividing the word of truth has to do with the whole Bible, but in particular, Paul in Ephesians 1.13 talked about the gospel of our salvation being the word of truth. And then you have James 1.18 talking about the salvation of Israel being the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. One of the most important reasons we've got to rightly divide the Bible is because there's more than one gospel in the Bible. And if you conflate those things and confuse those things, you can wind up damning people to hell. You want to tell me something more serious than that? If I get up and preach Acts 2.38 as the plan of salvation, I'm sending people to hell if they believe it. You can't get saved off Acts 2.38. It's the word of truth. It's just not the word of truth in this age of grace to you. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The gospel, the grace of God, was revealed by Christ to Paul. It's how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and we're saved by grace without works. The moment we simply believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are instantly and permanently justified. Gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized. The kingdom is at hand. you got to endure to the end. And prove your faith by your works. I don't think works save anybody in any dispensation, but I do believe in time past and in the ages to come, there's times where God tells a man, if you believe my word, this is what you'll do about it. Faith that works. But in this age, you understand, in this age, Paul said to him, that worketh not but believeth, his faith is counted for righteousness. So in the age of grace, if you try to do any works, it shows you don't really believe the gospel of the grace of God. I'm talking about for salvation. But in the tribulation period, they're gonna, you know it's going to happen. Peter warned about it. He said there are things in Paul's epistles hard to be understood. He said there are going to be people resting it to their own destruction. I guarantee you in the tribulation period, there are going to be preachers saying, you're saved by grace without works. Go ahead, take the mark of the beast. You've you got eternal security. You see that? The devil will use gospels in the Bible the masterpiece of his deception is that he it's not that he denies there is a gospel, he just offers you the wrong one for the age you're living in. Gospel of the kingdom, gospel of the circumcision. No, you're saved by the gospel of the grace of God when you believe and put all your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the kingdom required water baptism. The gospel of the kingdom was accompanied by signs. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he said, those signs will cease. Two different things. And we can go on and on. We've shown you many other messages. But I'm telling you, as we conclude this morning, you've got to get that main division. That's a whole other message. But we have a tract out there on the main division. We've taught on this before. The main division in the Word of God boils down to when Peter said to Israel in Acts 3, what I'm telling you is spoken by the prophets since the world began. Concerning the kingdom of God. Israel's God's earthly people. He's going to use them to reign over the nations. He's going to bring His kingdom to earth through the nation Israel. That's spoken by the prophet since the world began. But then the mystery is a secret that God planned before the world began. Kept it hidden in Himself. Paul received this by revelation. And it's the mystery of the body of Christ that's neither Jew nor Gentile. It's one new spiritual body where His heavenly people destined to reign in heavenly places. So when I, Paul said, what I'm telling you was kept secret since the world began. Romans 16, 25. 
Once you see the main division between prophecy and mystery, all the other divisions like different baptisms and different gospels and different... These other divisions will fall into place if you acknowledge the main division. But like I said, the most important thing is to see the division between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. What are you trusting in? Are you saved? If you died right now, where would you be? Are you saved? How do you know it? I'm going to tell you right now. If you think you're saved because of something you've done, you're not saved. It doesn't matter what, fill in the blank. I don't care what it is. If you said I'm saved because I wiggled my little finger, you're not saved. If it's anything you can do, that's not the grace of God. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll get saved when you know you're a lost sinner. Can't get saved till you know you're lost. And that you can't offer God anything He'll accept. And so you put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and His shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection. The moment you trust Christ in your heart to save your soul, you'll be saved and eternally secure. What are you trusting in? You can't trust. You say, well, Christ and. If you add anything, you've perverted the gospel. Let him be accursed. Paul said in Galatians 1. And the gospel of the grace of God is you're saved by grace through faith without works. If you're not saved, you can do it right now between you and the Lord. You don't have to come up here and tell me anything. I'm, not, I'm no priest. I, I, there's only one mediator between God and men. That's the man Christ Jesus. I, I, said, I implore you and beseech you, go to Jesus Christ in your heart and He'll save you. And nobody will know it till you tell Him. And you ought to tell Him. <laughs> he that believeth shall not be ashamed. Let's stand together, please.